The police are starting to figure out how a man ended up getting shot. However, they still don't have a motive. Katrina Weber has the latest on the investigation this noon. It's an investment in the lives of foster care youth. That's how a district judge describes a program that he helped to found. Stephen Cavazos tells us how the program is making a difference in people's lives. Still ahead. Live from Case at 12, the news at noon starts right now. And we begin with some late breaking news this noon. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announced his resignation just about an hour ago. It came after New York's attorney general released the results of an investigation that found that Cuomo sexually harassed at least 11 women. Cuomo still faces the possibility of criminal charges with a number of prosecutors around the state moving to investigate him. In his news conference this morning, he apologized for his actions, but also said the report is a political move by his opponents. Cuomo said he would step down because it was the best way to serve the state while the justice process is underway. The fall from grace comes a year after he was widely hailed nationally for his detailed daily briefings and leadership during the pandemic. New at noon, coronavirus concerns now prompting San Antonio and Bear County to sue Governor Greg Abbott over his ban on mask mandates. If this challenge is successful, it means big changes for our community. The county would issue a mask mandate and put quarantine procedures in place at local public schools. The county and the city filed the lawsuit today seeking a temporary restraining order that would allow officials to, quote, immediately issue an order requiring masks in public schools and requiring quarantine if an unvaccinated student is determined to be in close contact with a COVID-19 positive individual, end quote. On July 29th, Governor Abbott issued an executive order banning mask and vaccine mandates as well as capacity limits. In a tweet, San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg says that he is challenging the governor because he wants to protect our schools. He also said unvaccinated kids should not be forced to gamble with their lives. The governor said he enacted his executive order so that Texas can move forward and rely on personal responsibility and not government mandates. The lawsuit comes amid a surge of COVID-19 infections that have pushed hospitals to the limit across the state. Here in San Antonio, 1,197 patients are in the hospital fighting the virus. As well, 181 people are on ventilators and 314 patients are in the ICU. Meanwhile, our seven day average for new cases is running at 1,237. And happening tonight, our city leaders will go back to doing live briefings, updating the community about the pandemic. They'll take place on Tuesdays and Thursday nights at 613. And you can watch it live right here on KSET 12 during our six o'clock news. And Governor Abbott also getting some pushback on the mask mandate from leaders in other Texas communities that includes Dallas, Austin and Houston. Meanwhile, the governor has appealed for out of state help to fight the third wave of COVID-19 here in Texas. The governor has directed the Texas Department of State Health Services to use staffing agencies to find additional medical staff from beyond the state's borders as the Delta wave began to overwhelm its present staffing resources. He also has sent a letter to the Texas Hospital Association to request that hospitals postpone all elective medical procedures voluntarily. And this could be some good news for parents who are hoping to get their young children vaccinated. The American Academy of Pediatrics now calling on the FDA to fast track vaccines for kids. As ABC's Rena Roy reports, this comes as the Delta variant appears to be infecting children at increasing rates. Frontline workers overwhelmed as patients with COVID-19 fill hospitals yet again. In Arizona, some so burnt out, they're leaving the job. No one, no one, no one will ever understand what we have seen and what we have been through. In New Orleans, concern over the rising number of hospitalized children. The majority of the patients who have been admitted are between 10 and 13 years of age, which puts them right at or just below the age of vaccination. Nearly 94,000 pediatric cases have been reported in just the last week, and children are hospitalized at a rate nearly four times higher than just a month ago. The American Academy of Pediatrics urging the FDA to grant emergency 
emergency use authorization of vaccines for 5 to 11 year olds as quickly as possible. We need to be approaching um, uh, the trials and the authorization of the COVID vaccine for children with the same urgency that we did with adults. For now, experts say the best way to protect kids is to vaccinate those around them. The biggest thing that we can do is get vaccinated yourself because that will protect your children or protect other people's children. The good news is vaccinations are increasing with the CDC saying first doses are up 88 percent in the last month. And vaccine mandates are going into effect across the country. The Pentagon planning to make the vaccine mandatory for all service members by mid-September and possibly even sooner if full FDA approval is given or COVID-19 numbers go up even more. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. In other news, back here at home, San Antonio police still working to find a man's killer several weeks after he was shot and killed on the east side. Police say back on July 1st, they found Raymond Sneed dead at the Alamo Estates Apartments in the 8,000 block of Mid-Crown Drive. That's near Walsham Road. While they don't know who pulled the trigger, officers do tell us a witness saw a woman leaving the scene at the time of the shooting. If you have any information that could help police with this case, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. San Antonio police say that a man's final words were to his wife, and now they're hoping that someone will talk to them and tell them who killed him. They found him in a parking lot on East South Cross near South New Braunfels, dead after calling his wife and telling her he'd been shot. As Katrina Weber reports, police believe the shooting happened at a different location. The trouble was clear even from a distance. Police cars and an ambulance all concentrated in a parking lot of this Dollar General store on East South Cross. In the middle of them was a truck with a man who police say had been shot in the face. Although he died, they say 57-year-old Juan Martinez had just enough time to call his wife around 10.30 last night. Police say their investigation then led them to a different location, a gas station about a block away. They believe Martinez was there in his truck when he was shot. Why it happened appears to be a question they haven't answered yet, although they are piecing together how it happened. Investigators believe that the killer was actually able to reach inside the victim's truck and shoot him. And they say although he was wounded, the victim was able to drive the short distance to the Dollar General where they found him. Paramedics initially tried to do CPR but realized they couldn't save him. As Martinez's life slipped away, police say the killer ran away and still hasn't been caught. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. New at noon, providing guidance and instilling self-worth. That's been the mission of Eagles Court. The program launched last year and is designed to equip teen boys in foster care with the tools they need to succeed in life. Steve Cavasso shows us how this court is making a difference. Building esteem, achievement, grit, learning, and leadership, empowerment, and strength. It's known as Eagles Court. 73rd Judicial District Court Judge David Canales says it's an investment in the lives of foster care youth. And we wanted to give them an, uh, an, uh, just resources to help them, uh, you know, as they age out, find ways to be successful and uh, productive members of our community. Judge Canales helped found the court last year, which he currently presides over. Eagles Court aims to help teen boys in the foster care system. The program is similar to Pearl's Court, which assists teen girls. Both courts provide therapeutic care, life skills training, and mentoring. Judge Canales says since Eagle Court's inception, it's been a journey of self-discovery for the teens. We saw these kids just find that strength in themselves to, to be confident into, as to who they are, be confident about uh, where they're going. Nathaniel Aviles not only serves as a mentor, but he also grew up in the foster care system. Being in the foster care system myself, there's um, there's been a, 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 an array of different challenges. Avila says past trauma, mental health, and even substance abuse can be difficult to overcome, but he believes Eagles Court helps them break those barriers and identify their unique strengths. Highlighting the resilience um, that each kid has is definitely going to be beneficial for them. Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. Currently, 14 boys are enrolled in Eagles Court, and while they have been meeting virtually throughout the pandemic, program managers are hoping to recruit more. They are also looking for more mentors. You can head over to our website, ksed.com, for more information. We're in the throes of the summer doldrums here in San Antonio with dry, hot, and humid weather expected for a while, but there's a little glimmer of hope in the form of rain chances. I'll be back with a look at those rain chances coming up in a few.
And still to come this half hour, the Spurs youngsters are in Vegas. Wind's not adding up, but valuable playing time is. More on that coming up in sports. It is the first day of class for students across IDEA public schools. At one campus on the city's east side, a first grade teacher is pulling some double duty. She's also authoring two children's books. Miss Rhonda Brown gained popularity during the pandemic after she started reading books on Facebook Live. And now that she's an author herself, she can share books that reflect the community she teaches in. Alicia Barrera met with that author and shows us the impact these books have made. Miss Rhonda Brown says she's always loved readings, but her as well as her students have always noticed one thing. These books are great, but they don't really represent them or the cultural backgrounds where they come from. So Miss Rhonda Brown decided to write a book encouraged by her daughter. That's when she began to work during the pandemic and write a book about diversity titled Creation. That's me. Idea Najim Academy is so thrilled for the author. Administrators tell me they have a big focus on culture and diversity. Therefore, they have approved that Mrs. Brown include her books in her curriculum. The storyline and creation that's me as well as the characters have empowered kids and even adults. One 30 year old woman sharing with Miss Brown that she had never seen herself in a book. The little girl that has vitiligo, the little um, girl that has autism and also there are very dark skin um, black individuals in the book. I am a dark skin black lady. Um, and I have a lot of children that come from that background and they just really had never seen themselves in the book. The response from readers was so great that Miss Brown wrote a second book titled Created to Be, Yes, It's Me. That follows those same characters after they've graduated and accomplished their goals. And both of these books are available online. They range from 15 to $20 or $30 for the bundle on ksat.com. We have that link to purchase. Reporting Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. What a way to make a difference. Yeah. Outside with life, yeah, making a difference. I don't, is it different today than it was yesterday? No, it's exactly <laughs> it as like it was say, yesterday. Yeah. It really was, but I'll, I'll, I'll play along. I'll say that the breeze is making a difference. There you go. It could have been a lot worse without that breeze out there. Now, the aquifer did take a bit of a hit. It's down seven-tenths of a foot over the past 24 hours, but still very healthy, especially for August terms. We're about almost... 10 feet above the monthly average. Looking at the pollen count, we do have molds in high amounts, a little bit less than yesterday, but still high. Pigweed and fall elm are present in low amounts. All right, let's go ahead and take a look outside with live cam. We've got some puffy cumulus clouds out there. It's 89, but that 89 feels like 94. And again, there's that breeze from the south at 14 miles per hour. It feels like it's 98 in Pleasanton, 100 in New Braunfels. It's no wonder that today is a CPS energy peak energy demand and day. We're going to try to lower our usage to help our grid between 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. You know what? It's probably going to be a peak energy demand day for a while because it's going to be hot in the forecast. Your forecast coming up in a bit. Looking outside, it is a pretty day. Going to be hot. Turn, you know, I just called the AC company and said I need need some service. Yeah, the, guess mm. what, guys? The AC in my car went out. Oh no, uh, I that know. hurts. I'm hoping uh -oh. it's just like a tiny little issue with the Freon, and not that's <laughs> why you have that wind blown look today. <laughs> okay, thanks, Ursula. Now you got me a little insecure about my hair, girl. <laughs> no, it looks all great. Right, all right, let's take a look outside with uh, live cam. Puffy cumulus clouds. We've got some uh, beautiful blue skies there too. It's nice to look at from a distance, but when you Tack on the fact that it's hot outside. It's 89 degrees already with a heat index of 94 south winds at about 15 miles per hour right now. And those winds are helping us out a little bit. Doesn't feel as bad in the shade, uh, but we are quickly going to be continuing to warm up here in the afternoon. Our high temperatures will be in the mid 90s with a heat index value of 100 to 105. So on the satellite picture, nothing but sunshine around San Antonio. Uh, we are seeing tons of sun from San Antonio 
up I-10 to Kerrville, out 90 toward Hondo and Savinal and down toward Pleasanton. A wider view, though, it was a cloudy start for Del Rio and Valverde County. Those clouds have now just started to break up and temperatures in Del Rio, which are usually quite a few degrees warmer than us here in San Antonio, they're actually down a degree. It's it's 88 degrees in Del Rio, 88 in Yavaldi, but it's 94 in Catula, 90 in Gonzales and 92 in Beeville. Here's the current heat index. The uh, 89, as I mentioned, feels like 94. It feels like 100 in New Braunfels. It feels like 101 in Gonzales. And it feels like uh, 97 in Catula. Uh, throughout the rest of the afternoon, that heat index is going to be very high, feeling like 100 to 105 during the peak heating hours of the day. Again, 2 to 7 p.m. And looking at the wind gusts, winds are gusting from the south at about up to 25 miles per hour in places. And so, again, we have this to our advantage. A little bit of a breezy wind, going to feel fine outside. With, if you're in the shade. But for the rest of the day today, uh, again, 96 for the high. South winds at 10 to 20, gusts up to 30. Sun will set at 820. And as it does so, our temperatures will drop back into the 80s. By midnight, we're going to see those clouds roll back in and we'll start tomorrow with some cloud cover as well. But it'll be quickly burning off. Weather pattern fairly quiet across the U.S. today. There are some areas of rain just to the east of the Mississippi. But we've got a ridge of high pressure in place. High means dry creek sinking air prevents us from seeing significant rainfall and that high is going to be around for the next several days. I'll take you through the future cast here and tomorrow is going to be a day a lot like today. High temperature of 96 degrees. A few more clouds out there. You will notice that I did put a 10% chance for rain, uh, but that is a very low chance. The reason for that is there are going to be a few coastal showers that will develop tomorrow afternoon through Saturday and there is an off chance that one or two of them will make a run for that I-35 corridor. Specifically, only a 10% chance. But if you're looking for better rain chances, we got to wait until Sunday and Monday. Around that time, that high pressure system will be off near uh, the Me mountains of Mexico and we'll see a few thunderstorms develop in North Texas. Those will produce outflow boundaries and about a 30% chance for rain in San Antonio Sunday and Monday. Of course, we've got to talk about potential tropical cyclone number six. It it is likely to become Tropical Storm Fred very soon here, and it's probably going to be moving across uh, the Dominican Republic Haiti area by Thursday across Cuba by Friday and potentially impacting Florida in the Eastern Gulf Saturday and Sunday. So if you have interest in Florida, pay attention this weekend uh, because there is the possibility that what will become Tropical Storm Fred will impact the weather here, though. It's going to be a fairly mundane in the forecast highs in the mid 90s. No triple digits yet. Hey, coming up, I've got some interesting facts about how cool this summer is compared to last summer. It still feels hot, but comparatively a little cooler. This will make you feel even cooler. Yeah. Thank you. Now, the Spurs young guns still struggling for wins, but they're gaining a lot of experience. Now they're in Vegas and Deshaun Watson is back on the practice field for the Texans, but you wouldn't know it from talking to the other guys. The Spurs youngsters not feeling the thrill of victory, but they are getting better and getting more experience. They were winless in Utah, and they started winless in Vegas against the Timberwolves last night. They didn't get into a rhythm, though, in the second quarter. First round draft pick Joshua Primo drives inside. Turn on at eight last night. Here's three more. Trey Jones is going to find Primo beyond the arc. There it is. 33-32, but they trailed 49-38 at halftime. Fast forward to the fourth quarter. Devin Vassell comes alive. 15 of a team high 26 in that fourth quarter, including a game tying three pointer with 44 seconds left. Minnesota scores a game winner on the post. The, C the Spurs fall 91 89. Trey Jones is back in the lineup for the first time and scored 16 points last night. I had to knock some rust off, um, but I'm just trying to stick with it. Uh, something that you know the coaches were um, trying to stay on us about was um, picking it up on the defensive end. So. I'm trying to be a leader for our team. I knew that if I were to pick it up on that end, um, the other guys would um, as well. And during halftime of that Timberwolves Summer League game last night, we got to hear from gold medal winner and Spur Keldon Johnson. The Spurs forward helped Team USA win that gold medal in Tokyo. He was first picked for the select team to help get him ready to go to the Olympics. But before they headed to Tokyo, he got promoted to the varsity when two players were forced to drop out. 
It didn't hit me yet. You know, I'm kind of like uh, still just living in the moment, but I think it's definitely uh, crazy. I think uh, you know, I'm 21 with a gold medal. I'm definitely blessed. And uh, some people got sick, some people got hurt, and uh, but we still maintain and uh, we came out with the gold. You know, uh, we didn't give in to what everybody was saying. Uh, we knew what we were capable of and we knew uh, what we had to do to win. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Hey, Deshaun Watson back on the practice field for the Houston Texans. He missed five days of workouts without explanation. The quarterback of the Houston Texans is facing 22 civil lawsuits for sexual assault and misconduct during massages and is also under investigation by the NFL. He has demanded a trade, but the Texans have not led on as to why he was not on the field for the last five days. Even the players seem reluctant to reveal much, even if he's been in the building the last five days. Sure, I can't tell you. I don't know. I can't. I don't. I just be worried about where I'll be at. I, I, I seen him time to time, but I can't really tell you where you'll be at. The Texans are preparing for their first preseason game against the Green Bay Packers. That's coming up this Saturday. There is no question who the star is of the Dallas Cowboys at training camp. It's second year wide receiver CeeDee Lamb, who has made spectacular catches in Oxnard after an incredible rookie year in the league where he was just shy of 1,000 yards receiving. Now he's gone viral on social media with some of his receptions getting more playing time at wide out than slot receiver while his teammate Amari Cooper is still on the mend coming off ankle surgery in the offseason. So good to see CeeDee Lamb yeah. making great plays. Looking forward to the season. Yeah. Coming up in the next half hour, looking forward to that too. A scam warning for parents. How crooks are trying to take advantage of people benefiting from the child tax credit. And noon today at five, the pandemic has put a strain on many U.S. households. And for who considered a payday loan, one look at the interest rates might make you think twice. Coming up today at five, 12 on your side, Marilyn Moritz has the alternative avenues that could get you the help you need, minus all the fees. The long-awaited bipartisan infrastructure package to fund roads, bridges, broadband, and other federal construction projects across the country has now passed the U.S. Senate. It happened this morning. It comes after weeks of negotiations, delays, and procedural hurdles. ABC's Faith Abube has the latest from Washington, where lawmakers say they still have a lot of work to do. A significant show of bipartisanship on Capitol Hill, now pushing one leg of President Biden's two-pronged approach to infrastructure in Congress. On this vote, the yeas are 69, the nays are 30, the bill as amended is passed. Several Republicans joining every Democrat in the Senate, giving final approval to the $1.1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure package, which includes $550 billion in new spending. It's been a long and winding road. But we have persisted, and now we have arrived. The plan sets aside $110 billion for roads and bridges, $39 billion for public transit, and $65 billion to expand broadband internet. We can do big things on a bipartisan basis if we put our minds to it. The bipartisan plan now heads to the House, where Speaker Nancy Pelosi says Democrats won't take up the measure until a companion budget spending bill also clears the Senate. Monday, Senate Democrats unveiling that $3.5 trillion budget blueprint, hoping to fill it with progressive priorities like money for social safety net programs left out of the bipartisan plan. Details include universal pre-K, free two-year college tuition, expanding Medicaid to cover dental, vision, and hearing aids, and resources to address climate change. Senate Democrats plan to use a budgetary tool called reconciliation that requires only 50 votes to pass. But it won't be easy. They will need all 50 Democrats in the Senate and almost all in the House to back the effort. Republicans say the package is too expensive and will increase the risk of inflation. This new reckless taxing and spending spree will fall like a hammer blow on workers and middle class families. And so what's next? While well, the Senate now begins work on that budget spending bill, they hope to be done sometime in September and send that as well over to the House. In Washington, Faith Abube, ABC News. The IRS and Better Business Bureau are issuing warnings about a potential scam. The agency says cyber criminals are actively trying to scam families out of their tax credit money for children. The cybersecurity firm Domain Tools reports it has found nearly 50 sites pretending to be part of the government's American Rescue Plan. 
That includes the child tax credit. The sites claim to help you enroll in the program. They ask for your social security number and driver's license or state ID number to apply. And they'll be able to steal um, someone's refund check and also, you know, log into uh, any sort of bank account information. Yeah, the IRS reminds people that it does not contact taxpayers via email, text messages, or social media platforms to request personal or financial information for verification or any information related to the child tax credit. Matter of fact, those are eligible for the advanced child tax credit will be automatically enrolled using tax information from 2019 and 2020. The Federal Emergency Management Agency is going to be testing its National Emergency Alert System on Wednesday afternoon. According to the agency, it's just part of regular testing. FEMA says the test has been planned for more than a year. It should happen at 1.20 tomorrow afternoon. The Federal Alert test is going to be sent to televisions and radios. It's going to last about a minute. A wireless alert will be sent to those who've opted in on their phones to receive text messages. According to recently filed court documents, unaccompanied migrant children are reporting poor conditions at a temporary facility in Pecos, Texas. Those conditions include long stays at the facility, undercooked food, and long waits for medical care. It's the latest in a series of issues raised by children at temporary facilities overseen by the Department of Health and Human Services. Last week, the HHS Inspector General announced it was launching a review in the troubled Fort Bliss uh, facility that also shelters minors who cross the U.S. southern border alone. No word from HHS about the Pecos facility. A massive wildfire continues to threaten rural communities in California. However, yesterday, crews did make some progress. The Dixie Fire is 22% contained now. Crews worry that hot, dry weather and wind gusts, however, could fuel the flames over the next few days. That fire destroyed more than 600 homes and other buildings and gutted the town of Greenville. It's the largest of some 100 large blazes burning in more than a dozen western states. Overseas communities in Greece also dealing with out of control flames. As those fires rage on, boats are on standby to rescue the survivors. As ABC's Maggie Rulli explains, volunteers are stepping up to help fire crews. The people that chose not to evacuate this island that are the ones left behind, left to defend their homes. Look behind me. This is a group of people calling themselves the human shield. The fire right now is just on the other side of this village. It is less than a mile away from where we're standing. All these people say they're ready to stand side by side with firefighters if needed. And this is the kind of stuff we've been seeing all over Greece. You know, right now Greece is getting hit very hard in this wildfire outbreak. Uh, the prime minister saying nearly 600 fires have popped up in just the last week alone. Record breaking temperatures topping 100 degrees degrees on some days, still nearly 100 degrees today. These are extremely dangerous and what some people are calling unprecedented conditions. And in the thick of this, it's really volunteers that are stepping up to help firefighters. You see uh, the group behind me, but it's so much more than that. We also met uh, one man who was volunteering a truck that his company owns to actually go out on the front lines and help with a hose to put out these fires. We met another woman who went around helping rescue dogs that had been left behind uh, during the evacuation. She's literally been sleeping with them for days on the beach to keep them safe. Uh, people really stepping in, neighbor helping neighbor, telling us uh, they're angry the government isn't doing more, but they're going to step in uh, to help the rest of their citizens here in Greece. And unfortunately, it is still going on. We mentioned those temperatures still near 100 today. Uh, firefighters are still battling blazes here on the island of Evia and across Greece, and they don't seem to be stopping anytime soon. Maggie Rooley, ABC News, Evia, Greece. That's some tough news over there in Greece. Kind of makes you guilty when you see skies like this and no wildfire here at the moment. No. Uh, and, you know, it's really interesting because it's plenty hot outside, but we still technically have not hit 100 degrees so far this year at the airport. Again, it's still hot outside. And so because of that, there today is a CPS Energy Peak Energy Demand Day between the hours of 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. CPS is suggesting that you lower your energy use to uh, allow for uh, ease on the power grid. Did you know that if you're outside it's 96 degrees and the inside thermostat is 20 degrees cooler than that so even if your inside thermostat was at 76 degrees 
it would be running continually. So again, it's it's a key thing to lower your energy usage between 2 to 7 p.m. Now outside right now, puffy cumulus clouds, 89 degrees, heat index of 94. So it's already feeling very hot outside. And in the afternoon, the peak heat index should be anywhere from 100 to 105. And so it's going to be a very hot day. This kind of weather we can pretty much copy and paste to uh, the next couple of days but there is still a chance for rain on the horizon and I'll tell you whether or not we'll actually reach 100 degrees technically coming up in just a bit. David. Thank you Sarah. Some scary moments for a hiker after she passed out on the trail. When she woke up she came face to face with a Hollywood celebrity. The actress who helped her later in the show. Get outside with live cam. If you're going to go out and enjoy the outdoors, you might want to make sure you got a hat on, light colored clothing, because even though it's 90 degrees, it's still kind of warm up there. Absolutely. And, you know, the aquifer, even though we haven't really seen a lot of rain in the last week or so, it's down seven tenths of a foot over the past 24 hours, but it's still healthy. It's still almost 10 feet above the monthly average for August, and that 10 day average is nowhere near that 660 threshold that would enact stage one water restrictions. So we're doing all right in the aquifer. In the pollen count though, molds are high past 1,000. Pigweed and fall elm are low. Back to those rain chances. We've got some chances in the next seven days. I'll talk about those coming up. Not 100 degrees in San Antonio yet. Oh, but, don't say yet. I mean, okay, well, she's saying yet because I said yet on this graphic okay. behind me. I know that might okay. be jinxing it, okay? But is that jinxing it or is that I not jinxing it? Because if you say, you're just, you're just begging karma. I'll add a qualifier there. You know, our, our all-time hottest temperature of 111 degrees was set in September. So it's not out of the question for us to see 100 degrees. But David was talking, asking me during the break, when was the last time we did not see 100 degrees in San Antonio for a summer? 2007. So not all that long ago. It's possible. Yeah, we've seen zero 100-degree days so far this summer. The hottest we have been was on August 1st, just last week, when we were at 90, uh, 97 degrees degrees. Compare that with last year, okay? The entire year last year, we saw 36 100 degree days and the hottest we were was 107 on July 13th. That was the all time hottest temperature ever recorded in July. And you know, with climate change, the extremes are going to be more extreme. So you've seen last year we had an extremely hot year and it was so much hotter that we beat a few records. This year, we've been able to enjoy a milder summer, but it's not over yet. We've still got plenty of summer days on the calendar to see 100 degrees, although I will say I am not forecasting 100 in the next seven days, so there we go. All right, we're going to see mostly sunny skies for the rest of the afternoon. 96 for the high, a heat index of 100 to 105. Sun will set at around 820, and it's going to be pretty mild with temperatures falling into the 80s after the sun sets. Look at that visible satellite. Nothing but sunshine out there right now. A few puffy cumulus clouds for Canyon Lake, New Braunfels, and Seguin. We're also seeing tons of sun out near Bandera, Hondo, and Sabinal. Thankfully, we have a breeze. This breeze is from the south with gusts up to about 25 miles per hour. Makes it feel tolerable in the shade. But again, you will not see me outside during the peak heating hours of the day because it is hot out there regardless of that breeze. 93 in Pleasanton, 91 in Gonzales, 90 in New Braunfels, 94 in Catula, and 93 in Laredo. The heat index, though, is already 100 in New Braunfels, and it's already at 102 in Gonzales. It feels like 94 here in San Antonio, 5 degrees hotter than what the thermometer actually reads. In the weather pattern, it's fairly quiet. We do have some rain for parts of the desert south. Southwest. Of course, that's welcome there. And then east of the Mississippi River, we've got some showers. Meanwhile, upstairs in the atmosphere, we've got a 
high pressure system, a ridge of high pressure that's uh, across parts of the Mississippi uh, River Valley, and that's going to create very hot temperatures. Areas up near Iowa will see heat index values well above 100 degrees this afternoon. For us here in San Antonio, tomorrow 96 for the high. However, there is a small chance, 10% for a stray shower because a few coastal showers are going to develop and they're going to try to make a run for that I-35 corridor. It is unlikely that they're going to get to the I-35 corridor, but the chance is still there. It's only a 10% chance through the remainder of the week and into the weekend. Meanwhile, we are going to see that high move out of place and then by Sunday and Monday some storms in North Texas are going to develop. They're going to create rain cooled outflow boundaries that further on down the line could fire up a few showers and storms. And so that's why Sunday and Monday we have a 30 percent chance for rain on Sunday and Monday. Meanwhile, off to the east, what will become Tropical Storm Fred is expected to impact the eastern Gulf Coast and potentially Florida Saturday through Sunday as well. We'll be keeping track of what will become Tropical Storm Fred. We also have the Hurricane Tracker app that you can get and it'll send notifications right to your phone if you have interests in Florida. That is, of course, some people are still trying to make some late season Disney World trips happen. Tomorrow is Wednesday and we'll be waking up with some morning clouds. It'll be breezy and 88 at noon, 96 for the high temperature tomorrow. Once again, you guessed it, a heat index of 100 to 105. South winds at 10 to 20, gusting up to 25 miles per hour. Just a few coastal showers Wednesday through Saturday, and then Sunday and Monday, that's when we introduce that 30% chance for isolated rain. Again, no 100 degrees technically in the forecast over the next seven days, although it's going to feel like 100 degrees, and 100 degrees is an arbitrary number after all. It's not like freezing when temperatures get Yes, down. let's not fixate. Yeah, I agree, Ursula. Let's not fixate. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's hard not to. <laughs> London's Tower Bridge got stuck for several hours, and while traffic slowed, Twitter was quick. It had lots of jokes and parody songs, and we're going to take a look coming up. And a hiker who collapsed in the Utah wilderness got some help from an unlikely source, a Hollywood actress. That story coming up after the break. A woman says she fitted while she was hiking in Utah and a sitcom star helped her out. Minnie John was with her family climbing to the summit of the Arches National Park last week when she began to feel faint and lightheaded. She said she stopped to sit down and rest and told her husband and her son to continue without her. John ended up passing out and hit her face on a rock. She woke up to actress Julie Bowen, one of the stars of Modern Family, asking her questions. They didn't have to stop. They cleaned me up and they uh, gave me stuff to eat. And, I mean, she knew what she was doing. First thing I thought was uh, my mom must be hallucinating. <laughs> so I, like she she hit her face or maybe her head. I didn't know. But yeah, ma I thought she had a concussion. Bowen and her sister, who's a doctor, helped John contact her husband and son. They also gave her electrolytes and some food and treated her wounds. John says the actress was so nice that she even took a picture with her. Ah, we knew she was nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> One of London's most famous landmarks got stuck on Monday. Officials are blaming technical issues for the predicament. CNN's Jeannie Most reports on how social media users are bridging the gap with some jokes. When London's Tower Bridge got stuck in the opposition, vehicular traffic came to a halt. But social media traffic jumped. As posters made sarcastic suggestions, have they tried WD-40 and created Godzilla memes? I think I see the problem here, Tower Bridge. The much documented Tower Bridge lift occurs about 800 times a year. The buttons are pushed. Stand by bridge crew, about to stop road traffic. The joystick is pulled. On Monday, it was to let a wooden tall ship called the Tenacious Pass. But the bridge itself became tenacious when it was time to lower the roadway. The famous landmark had to endure puns. Tower Bridge just seemed a bit stuck up. And lots of commenters rewrote the lyrics to a ditty about another London bridge. London Bridge is falling down, falling down. Fall the lyrics were changed to Tower Bridge ain't falling down. And Tower Bridge has broken down, as well as 
London Bridge is stuck upright. No one's moving. The landmark's movable roadways were portrayed as pinball flappers. The Tower Bridge lift has been memorialized in movies like Spice World. Hold up your knickers, girl! <laughs> the bridge seems to bring out classic lines like John Wayne and Brannigan exclaiming, John Wayne made the leap, crashed into a dumpster. When something this famous gets stuck in the upright position, prepare for mockery. Genie Mouse, CNN. Oh, nice. New York. The best part is that we now know Genie Mouse can sing. Yeah, I didn't know that. We know now. <laughs> a lot of people with a lot of time on their hands, though. Hey, in just a few hours, SA Live is headed back to the classroom for their back to school special in prime time. It's from 7 to 8 tonight, right here on KSAT 12. And to get us ready for it, Mike and Fiona have a best of back to school show for us. Hey, guys. If you could believe it is already time for SA Live's primetime school special. It is at 7 o'clock tonight, of course, in primetime. And we are going to be live from the Sunshine Cottage School for Deaf Children. Can't wait to show you all the back to school tips, tech, fashion, you name it. And we have it tonight. Yes, and for now, we've rounded out some of the best back to school tips for summer, including the tech you need to make your school year a success. No more just box of crayons anymore <laughs> and a number two pencil. Hey, things that you can make yourself for the school year with the help from the rustic brush. And this is really going to help you, especially getting ready every day. And an after school art program in New Braunfels that will have you creating colorful masterpieces and for any age. Bryce Wild doctor and the guy always has some fantastic tips and he shares some natural foods that are really going to boost your energy without making you crash. That can be the big problem sometimes. And a kid's spa on the northwest side where you can get a little pampering in before the school year. Oh, your little mini mini me will look so cute. Extreme cuteness alert with that. These little girls in this are just adorable. That and a whole lot more is coming up on SA Live. So stick around.